Hi, and welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. True espionage tales of everyday characters called upon to become extraordinary against the backdrop of war-torn Europe during the World War I and II era are the hottest books flying off the shelves in the 2020s. And Kate Quinn, whose work NPR has praised as engrossing, suspenseful, and authentic, is among the finest writers at work with the pen, telling these important tales for the first time. Since becoming what the Washington Post called a word-of-mouth bestseller with the celebrated The Alice Network, she shined the spotlight on similar heroines and runaway hits like The Rose Code, The Diamond Eye, and The Huntress. And she's equally popular with fans for previous works like the Empress of Rome series, featuring along with the debut book of the same title, Daughters of Rome, Empress of the Seven Hills, The Three Fates, Lady of the Eternal City and Mistress of Rome, and the Borgia Chronicles, which include The Serpent and the Pearl and The Loin and the Rose. Deadline.com even reported recently that Black Bear Pictures, the team behind the Benedict Cumberbatch feature film The Imitation Game, is heading back to Bleshley Park, while The Rose Code sat at number three on the New York Times bestseller list in 2021. Kate takes time out from her busy schedule today to talk about it all. Thank you so much for being here. First, congratulations on Warner Brothers picking up the Alice Network to adapt into a TV series. It's really a fitting form in which to retell the story you first did on the page. A brave troop of women, indeed, who worked together for the British in France, gathering information about German troop movements and battle plans on the front lines of World War I. With the Alice Network, I was, you know, looking for something new to write. I was looking to dip my toe into the 20th century. And since this was late 2014, early 2015, what I was seeing online was an overwhelming preponderance of articles um, commemorating the 100th year anniversaries of various World War I dates. And so that had me looking specifically at World War I. And then I happened to, you know, since my question is always, you know, what are the women doing? What are the ladies up to when I'm looking at potential book topics, I stumbled across a wonderful novel, uh, or excuse me, not a novel, it's a nonfiction uh, book by Catherine Atwood called Women Heroes of World War One. And I was flabbergasted. I'd never even heard of most of these women. Uh, there were women in journalism and war correspondence. Bonnetsy. There were women in nursing, in medicine, and of course there were, there were women on the battlefield and there were women in espionage. And when I read about you know, the original essay in there about Louise de Bettigny and her queen of spies title and her network of uh, informants, many of whom were women in occupied France in World War I, I knew that was a hook I could I could and wanted to desperately hang a story on. You decorated it thereafter with the remarkable women that make up the Alice Network, including Louise de Bentonis, better known as Alice Dubois, the Queen of Spies, aka Lily, Marie Leon van Hout, Alice's Lieutenant, aka Violet Lemron, Cecil Cameron, the British spymaster, aka Uncle Edward, Eve Gardner, aka Marguerite Le Francois, the spy for Captain Cameron, college student Charlie St. Clair, Charlie's love interest, Finn Kilgore, and missing cousin Rose Fournier who herself was a very brave lady, working for the French resistance during World War I. Please give viewers a sense of the historical research that made its way into the book, from papers relevant to the Alice Network, to even how these characters authentically spoke, from say code language to the real speak of the day. The thing that really, you know, took me you know, and enchanted me about the Queen of Spies was, you know, how bold she was and how much humor she had. Uh, there were many quotes from her that I found in the course of my research, and she had this tremendous sense of dash and style. You know, she was the one who said, you know, when her lieutenant urged her to be more careful, she said, mm, I know we'll be caught eventually, but let us do great things while there is yet time. And I just thought, what a thing to say in the middle of a war zone. I mean, my hat is off to you. And the fact that, you know, she said that you know, she had she had a real gift for, you know, being able to bluff past checkpoints, you know, with either she was playing the ditzy female with a lot of shopping who keeps dropping her boxes until finally the guards are just like, oh, just please go. You're holding the line up or she's shuffling her card saying, I know it's in here somewhere. I'm so sorry. And, you know, she's she plays the ditz until again, it's like, all right, all right, you're fine. Just go. And she said, you know, at one point, you know, with any piece of paper and, with, and a little bit of nerve, you can always get past. And, you know, I, I, that again, it's like, what a thing to be able to do, you know, what a, what iron nerves she must have had. I am, had the opportunity there to weave in a fictionalized character to a very real uh, atrocity that happened during World War II, where a small French village was almost virtually wiped off the map. And it still stands today in a, as a ghost town memorial of itself, where if you go there, you will see these burned buildings and a roofless church and you know bullet holes in the walls and you know just things like a clock that's melted and lying in the street and you know a shattered water pot and it was left that way as a memorial to the village in which was destroyed in 1944 or 
I think it was 44. I'm sorry, excuse me. The um the uh, the dates and the research for this is some years ago. So I, it's been overlaid uh, sedimentarily like an archaeological excavation by other books since then. But it was an atrocity that's not very well known outside France because you know there were huge, hugely bigger things happening on the world stage. You know, the um the principles involved, you know, then uh, on the German side were often did not come to justice because they were, you know, immediately di diverted toward the allies who had landed in Normandy and many were killed there. So only a few were able to be brought to justice in uh, the 50s once a trial was actually convened. But it was a very real thing that did happen and I did want to pay homage to it and I used the authentic words of one of the survivors as much as I could who one of the women who did survive and who did tell her story many times since she lived to be old and she did not uh, move away from the area and she also told her story as a witness at the trial so I tried to use the words of the people who did survive it as much as I could. What was one of your favorite heart racing spy scenes that you recreated in the book? One of the things I loved the most that I, I knew it had to go in the book and I wouldn't have dared make up anything like this was she was on a train platform waiting to, I think, catch a meeting with British intelligence. And she happened to be recognized on the platform by a German general who recognized her from her old pre-war life when she had been a governess to his cousin's children in, I think, Bavaria. And, you know, he recognized her and, you know, proceeded to talk to her. And this could have been a disaster. She had a bag full of false identification and probably contraband. And, but instead she didn't turn hair and she apparently charmed him talking about a chess game that they had played at a castle before a ball, you know, way back when. And, you know, he realized that she had missed her train as they were conversing. So he lent her his car and his chauffeur so that she could uh, make her appointment in time. So I just thought I have to include the scene where the queen of spies is chauffeured personally to her meeting with British intelligence in a German general's car. <laughs> And I just thought that said everything I wanted to say about Louise de Bettigny and the kind of style she had and the kind of flair and, you know, the immense bravery underneath it that, you know, made her able to pull off the kind of stunts that she did of tremendous intelligence during war. Now, you very cleverly set this book between two periods, the first being 1947 in the very aftermath of World War II, and then back in 1915 during the start of World War I. Why did this dual narrative work best for telling the story of the pursuit of Ray Bourdillon that followed? It was something where I knew I wanted to have a dual timeline and I knew I wanted there to be one villain in the end who crossed both timelines and turned out to be the enemy for both women, both my World War I spy heroine and my post-World War II American heroine. So that did take a certain amount of thinking, like what would one man, what could one man have done to in the end, you know, end up, you know, quite to his detriment, pissing off two women you should never want to piss off. Um, by themselves, much less when they team up. And that became something that really tied into my research where I tended to take real events and then weave some fictional people or fictionalized people through them. My villain is fictionalized, but he sort of came to represent the fact that, you know, throughout both wars, there it, 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 there's an examination really of the word collaboration, collaborator, it's a very dirty word. It's an extremely gray territory. And it's something that the French have, you know, struggled with, you know, where to define that line when someone is simply trying to survive in an occupied zone. And when someone has literally crossed the line to where they're selling out their own countrymen for a profit. And where does that line fall? So that's where, despite the fact that this is a book that spans both world wars, the ultimate, you know, enemy in this book is not a, Fr a German, it's a French, it's a Frenchman. And I did want to sort of explore that whole, you know, gray area of collaborationism in there through that. And then also the fact that, you know, since I had two timelines, both World War I and then post-World War II, I really wanted to do that because the more I researched, the more it became clear that, you know, as Americans, we are taught the war, the two wars as two separate, discrete, distinct events. Um, we have the luxury of that because both of these wars, although they are world wars and hugely important in our history, they were fought at a distance. Even, you know, Pearl Harbor, you know, the closest we came to being invaded, that did happen thousands of miles from our mainland. We are taught the two wars as being things that happen very separately and, you know, a long way away. Um, but for countries like Belgium, like France, you know, countries that were occupied, they did not have that luxury. They were 
as a nation barely recovered from, or you know, still recovering really from the emotional and national wounds that were inflicted during one occupation, but when the second occupation comes rolling over the horizon. And that is a very different national mood. And to the French, to the Belgians, to many other countries, I didn't even have a chance to delve into in this book, the two wars really are just one war with a long 30 year detente in the middle. And those things are immensely important when you look at the war through a French or you know a Belgian lens. So that's really what I wanted to get in here as well is that there are a lot of wounds that were inflicted in the first war that are still being explored or bandaged over or you know still are extremely painful even just a few years after the second when there are fresh wounds being applied on top. And that's really the reason why I wanted to have two women whose experience spanned two wars all you know, converging on, you know, eventually on the same fight against the same man who has managed to evade justice for you know, 30, over 30 years. You captured the adventures of an entirely different group of heroic ladies for the first time on the page with the Night Witches, an all-female night bomber regiment wreaking havoc on Hitler's Eastern Front in the Huntress. When did they first fly into your creative view? I can't remember when I first read about them. It was a question of, you know, probably it was just something that, you know, flew across my screen or, you know, when I was reading about something else. And, but I knew a little bit about them, not much. Tactile details are what tend to make things really real. I was very lucky with The Night Witches that there was a wonderful book published in the 90s of interviews with the surviving Night Witches, of which there were quite a few. My personal, um, my personal belief in that is that if these women survived the war and that incredible uh, nonstop flying that they did, there wasn't much that could kill them. So a old age did not stand a chance. So there, there were a great many of them alive to give their stories, which were very clear, very well recounted, translated to English uh, for this English version. And so I had their words in their own from their own mouths. And they talked really some of them very movingly about what it was like to be exhausted and yet flying, you know, night after night after night, you know, what it was like to be in the air. What did it mean to them to do this? And, you know, they were very eloquent. And they were also extremely blasé, which really, you know, appalled me at times because, you know, you'd have some little a picture of like a little Russian babushka with her apple cheeks and her, you know, puff of hair and her, you know, her, her medals pinned to her cardigan. And then you see the girl that she was, you know, 19 in a jumpsuit with the same apple cheeks. And this old, little old lady would be saying, well, you know, sometimes the bomb gets stuck on the wreck. So your navigator would just climb out on the wing at, you know, a thousand meters and, you know, give it a push to get it going. And I'm just sitting there. Okay. All in a day's work, I guess. <laughs> so these are the things that they were saying, you know, quite matter of factly. And you know, or they said, you know, we got very tired in the air, you know, it was a lot of flying. So after a while, you'd, you'd reach an arrangement with your pilot, you know, you'd have to fly half an hour out and then half an hour back to the bombing site. So, you know, I'd sleep on the way out and she would sleep on the way back, <laughs> you know, catnaps in the, in the cockpit. Um, I did actually for this, I did one of the more fun pieces of hands-on research I've ever done, which is why I did get the chance to ride in a World War II era biplane. Uh, not the same kind that the Night Witches flew, but a very similar model. And so I, I learned a lot from that. I, I, I learned how small those cockpits are, how incredibly loud they are, how cold it can be, you know, this open cockpit flying. I do not even want to imagine how cold it was literally flying over Ukraine. <clears throat> in the dead of winter. And, you know, also just all kinds of fun things about how it moved and how did, how did the, how did it feel like to climb on the wing and then climb, drop into the cockpit. And, you know, my pilot, charming British pilot was wonderful. And he, uh, you know, literally was flying practice bombing runs all over the hills of San Diego. He did not let me climb on the wing and, you know, try to, you know, push out an imaginary bomb would you know, spoil sport. But other than that, uh, it really was a wonderfully instructive bit of uh, research. And I do encourage anybody who can, if you, Hands-on research is always good if you can do it. You can't always, but if you can, it's always good. And I knew I wanted to have something like that, but I also knew there was something missing and I wasn't sure what it was. And I think, as, as uh, you said, I, I do tend to look for these tales of these incredibly brave women or women who have done things that have not been perhaps um, sufficiently, you know, highlighted in the history books. And so I'm, you know, I was on literally something like a 2 a.m. Google hunt, you know, going down rabbit holes about, 
what what thread is this book missing? What can I put in? And that was when the story, uh, you know, somehow like on a daisy chain of internet articles, I found the Night Witches again, like at just the right time. And I thought, yes, this is it. They're going in. And I didn't know how. I wasn't sure how, honestly, the um, the tale of the hunt for a war criminal was going to braid in with the story of these uh, Russian women night bomber pilots and their incredible record with their all female regiment. But I knew I could, I knew I was going to make it happen somehow. And uh, after quite a good deal of hair pulling and um, outlining and uh, crossing things out and then going down new paths, I did manage to find a way to make those two puzzle pieces fit. On the other end of that spectrum, please introduce viewers who don't know to the Huntress who Nina Markova and British war correspondent turned Nazi hunter Ian Graham team up to pursue in an unlikely partnership together throughout the story that follows. I was trying to plot out the Huntress. I already knew it was going to involve the, the chase at both ends from the both the hunter and the hunted for a uh, Nazi war criminal who had gone to ground in the United States after the war. And that did really happen. Uh, my woman is fictionalized, but there was really the very first uh, Nazi war criminal to be extradited from the US for war crimes and sent back to Europe to stand trial was a woman who was discovered living as a housewife in Queens, New York, which just flabbergasted me. Congratulations on one of your most recent bestsellers, The Rose Code. When did you first become aware of the real life code breakers of Bletchley Park? And if you'd please acquaint viewers with the three main characters in the story, Olsa, a debutante whose fluent German allows her to become a translator of decoded enemy secrets, Mab, who works with the legendary code-breaking machines, and of course Beth, a village spinster with a natural talent for puzzle solving that allows her to become one of the lead female cryptanalysts in the group. Well, I knew it would have to be a multiple heroine story because I wanted the reader to walk away with the idea that Bletchley Park itself was something of a character in its own right. And also to walk away with an understanding to some degree of how it is that, you know, encrypted intelligence moved through those gates and then almost went on a sort of conveyor belt of different stations where everyone did their different piece to it and then came out again as usable intelligence that could be deployed in the field. And the thing that I realized very quickly is that if I tried to do that through only one woman's eyes, it really couldn't happen because the secrecy mania was so intense that everyone was encouraged to keep their eyes on their own work only. It was very stovepiped, as they call it. And so there isn't one woman who would have an understanding of the whole process. There just wasn't. So therefore, I knew I had to have, I thought three was a good number, three women who were all in different stages of the process. So therefore, I decided to have Beth, who is my uh, crypt cryptanalyst genius. She's the one, uh, one of those big brains whose responsibility it was quite you know, dauntingly to wedge a foot in the door of you know, an impenetrable wall of code and try to get that foot in the door so there's a crack so that the machines have a chance to get it open the rest of the way. And then there's Mab, the uh, London East Ender who is, whose job it is to maintain and work the machines who, have, who do the decoding and who do the rest of that cracking it open. And then there is Osla, who is my London debut or a Canadian born London debutante with a beautiful finishing school German, whose job it is to take all that intelligence once it's decoded and she's the one who translates it from German to English so that the, you know, the Admiralty and the British Army can use it on the, on the ground. And so with these three, you have more of an understanding of, okay, this is how the intelligence moves and this is the process that it undergoes. And that gave me a nice wide range of experiences too, because the other thing that fascinated me about Bletchley Park was really how truly diverse it was. You know, you could have people from all walks of life, all all levels of education and you know all strata of society working elbow to elbow and really it did not matter where you came from or what your education was if you could get the job done and the women who worked there really did talk with a certain nostalgia about you know there was a level of equality that they found there that they weren't likely to find in women's workplaces otherwise and they said you know this is a place where overall you know i'm not saying it's a complete bastion of total 21st century or 22nd, 23rd century equality, but it was a place where a woman's voice could be heard much more than it could on the outside in many places. So I wanted to show that. And, you know, I was able to show through my three ladies who come from very different you know, backgrounds. These are women who would not even have met in the ordinary course of life, much less become friends, but they are thrown together in this very unique place. And because of that, they do become friends. And because of that, they 
you know, the things, their own lives change forever. And, you know, you could even say that they have a, it has an effect on, you know, national, the national stage as well. Please talk a bit, if you would, about recreating the code breaking that they did in the book. It's a pretty tricky business. Did you have to take any kind of crash course yourself to fully understand how it works so you could then authentically recreate it for readers? And any favorite codes they broke together that but then proved consequential for the war portion of the story? The thing that made this book very unique, and it was a difficulty about writing a, a, a change from the Huntress and the um, Alice Network, is that this book is about code breakers and their fight is um, uh, their fight is emotional and intellectual and the arena that they fight on is in the mind. And they are not under danger, you know, spying in a war zone in danger of being arrested and shot. They are not in a cockpit of a plane dropping bombs in danger of being shot out of the sky. Uh, this is not physical danger that the women code breakers are in. It is more like a mental and emotional struggle. And the thing is that that is every bit as important and it is every bit as you know grueling, but at the same time, is it a, I, the challenge was, can I make this exciting? You know, the fact that their, their fight is, you know, a bunch of women who are, you know, locked up in little green huts, you know, scribbling on pieces of paper. And so it was a challenge to make this fight, you know, just as interesting and absorbing and, you know, fighting as, you know, soaring through the air in a bomber plane. And that really was a tricky thing to do. I hope I succeeded, but that was, that's the kind of fight that it was. And in the end, the, one of the things I wanted to make clear too to the reader is that intelligence is just a knowledge. Information is the most important commodity in any war because, you know, you can have, as one of the characters in the book says, all the bombs, all the arrows, all the spears, all the planes and war, warships in the world, if you don't know where to send them, where to deploy them, they are useless. Intelligence, information has always been one of, if not the most critical thing to fighting any war. You need to know what's going on. And that in the end is the thing that makes the Bletchley Park Codebreakers extraordinary because it's estimated that you know, maybe two years is too long, but they certainly shortened World War II by possibly as much as two years, and even less possibly. But if it's less, that's still going to be hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lives, if you're also considering people on the ground who are civilians being you know, horribly injured, injured or murdered by Hitler. And these are, that's the reason why their fight is important, even though it didn't involve physical danger. Share a bit, if you would, with viewers about your plotting process for laying out the timeline the book begins with, where the three meet during the war, then weaves through the third act of the story, where they unite again years later in 1947 in London at a wedding, and team up thereafter to break one last code together. Um, when I do dual timelines, I usually cut back and forth between them because I find it's easier to tease out the parallels between the two timelines when I'm cutting back and forth. But for this one, I wasn't sure what happened in that third act quite yet. Uh, so really, I wrote all the warrior stuff first at Bletchley Park, all the way up to D-Day, which is sort of the point when everything splits and then comes back together. And then after that, I had to sort of sit down and think, okay, what really does happen? I knew it was 1947. I knew it was going to be the lead up to the royal wedding. And I knew that, you know, history had given me this wonderful tidbit where um, we do know that there was a Russian mole at Bletchley Park who was passing information to the Soviets. And I thought, well, that makes a tremendously good post-war, uh, you know, uh, mystery to unravel after Bletchley Park closes down after the war. And I knew I needed that because, you know, if I just covered the warriors with Bletchley Park, it would have been, the book would have ended with, all right, girls, uh, please never talk about your work here. Uh, feel free to go home, get married and become housewives. And uh, yeah, again, just don't talk about anything you did here. And a lot, it would have been them saying, oh, okay, of course we'll do that. And that would have been the end. And that's not very exciting, but since history, so I wanted to have something after the war that would let us explore what did these women who had done this code breaking work feel now that the war was done and they had been told essentially to go home and just get on with things you know how does that feel you know it's is it difficult to put that work behind you or is it a relief and so that let me explore that and it also let me explore the whole idea of the fact that well there was a russian mole at bletchley park and how could that have unfolded in some direly secret way. And I love the idea too that, you know, my Bletchley people could pull together, you know, for the one last hurrah sort of idea, which I enjoyed a lot. And it allowed a little bit of a thread of tension to come through the book as well. The Rose Code is such a beautiful title. Did this one bloom into your mind right away? And how was that all important final touch to the canvas, so to speak, work throughout your catalog? 
The Alice Network was a, a working title just from the beginning, but everybody liked it. So we kept it. So that really was quite simple. Um, the Huntress went through a million different titles, it felt like, uh, before we finally found that one. It just we couldn't find the right thing. And then um, for the Rose Code, that was another one I kind of thought of from the beginning. Um, I already had some, you know, the rose is a great thematic image, and I already had some ideas for how, um, you know, because also the, the swirl of a rose's petals is, I think it's a Fibonacci sequence. So I actually thought that, like, as a way to sort of tie something that's a natural image plus something that is, you know, has its own internal mathematics and in, its own internal code was something that I thought would be a fun thing to explore thematically. So that also actually wove in from the start relatively quickly. Any other jewels of wisdom you'd share here for the aspiring author maybe stuck in the middle of their first book or their latest one coming from a pro like you would probably be appreciated? I think there's two bits of advice that, that link together, really. And one of those is that um, as my uh, husband, who's in the who's in the Navy, often says, there's sometimes you just have to embrace the suck, uh, embrace that something is going to be bad. And that's important for writers, because I've seen a lot of first time writers who get so paralyzed by that voice in your head that says, this is terrible. You don't know how to write a book. What made you think you could do this? They never write at all. And you need to get past that if you're going to be a writer. It is okay for that first draft to be bad. Just get it down. Because once it's down, you can fix it. And that leads to the second quote, which is, I believe, by the wonderful Nora Roberts, who said, I can fix a bad page. I can't fix a blank page. So my word of advice always is that you have to ignore the voice in your head that tells you it's terrible and just get it down. Because once you get it down, as bad as it is, and I guarantee you my first drafts are terrible, you get it down as bad as it is, you can fix it. And so that's really the thing I would encourage everyone to do is, you know, embrace the suck, let it be bad, give yourself permission to be bad, get it down, then fix it. Growing up in a family with a mother who's a librarian, I have to imagine you were surrounded by a lot of books as a child. Uh, yes, I my my ones that really got me kicked into historical fiction were um, the uh, Judith Merkel Riley, the late great. She did some wonderful, wonderful novels in the Renaissance and Middle Ages. Um, Eva Ibbotson, who wrote a lot of wonderful 20th century romance that just has some of the most fabulous prose you'll ever find. And uh, Bernard Cornwell, uh, who writes the best battle scenes in the business and who I discovered as a teenager and just, you know, absolutely read pretty much his entire, you know, backlist of, you know, probably 50 plus books in one summer. So these are the ones that I still return to when I'm thinking about what really made me love this. What inspired you early on in your career to pick up the pen and begin working on The Mistress of Rome, which became the first book in the Empress of Rome series to follow, which then featured Daughters of Rome, Empress of the Seven Hills, The Three Fates and Lady of the Eternal City. I have always had ancient Rome has been a real love of mine ever since I was young. My mother, who's a librarian, had a degree in ancient and medieval history. So this was stories I was hearing as a kid. You know, I was watching I, Claudius instead of the Disney Channel. And so I gravitated to ancient Rome rather naturally. And I really am drawn to uh, that first century Rome where, you know, it's before everything starts to crumble. And it's really when Rome is at its, its height, its peak. And I tell the story of a lot of the women there and, you know, the men as well who are involved in all walks of life in this very fascinating and very turbulent part of history. And I, I really did love it because, you know, there's Rome is fascinating, I think, because it was so advanced in some ways, you know, the architecture, the sculpture, the art, you know, the, the roads, the aqueducts, the, the feats of government and, and the achievements there. But at the same time, you also had you know, these wild beast hunts where, you know, animals are slaughtered for entertainment by the, by the thousand and gladiatorial shows and you have slavery and you have, you know, these wars that are going on where it's like, well, we like your province and so we're going to take it now. And, and you know, I, I know that that is still going on in the news today, essentially. I don't know how far we've come, but Rome remains a conundrum because on one hand they achieved so much and it was so beautiful in many ways. And yet at the other time, there were some parts of it that were hideous. And that, unfortunately, is where you have a lot of grist for novelists and their stories. I was really proud of my last one, Lady of the Eternal City, because that was about uh, Emperor Hadrian. It was one of the great emperors of the of great emperors of ancient Rome, but also one of the most hated. So why? You know, that was great to figure out. And it was about one of the best love stories I had fun writing, which was the, the famous love story between Hadrian and his freedman, Antonius, which is one of the great uh, love affairs of the ancient world or, or of really history at all, because, you know, this young man died and, you know, you had an emperor of the known world who was just incapacitated by grief. And he 
had so many statues carved of his this man this man he loved so much that you know that's a face that we know almost better than any other face in the ancient world because so many statues of him survived and he wasn't a great ruler he wasn't a prince he was just a man who the an emperor loved and you know i love that that you know that we this is a face that has survived you know because you know who knows us who knows us when we're gone especially when we've been gone a few thousand years well we still know this young man I have to imagine it's quite a set of eyes to write a character through, that of a quiet librarian who then becomes the deadliest sniper in female history, Lucinda Mila Pavlichenko, as you did so masterfully in Diamond Eye, where Publishers Weekly predicted historical fiction fans will be riveted. How did you first discover this unlikely hero's story waiting to be told? This came up when I was researching the, the Huntress and the Night Witches, because as I was learning about the all-women female bomber pilots, I was also coming across a great many more uh, Soviet women war heroines. And that is because the Soviet Union, and I'm no defender for the Soviet Union, their crimes back then or, or after the war uh, or since, but they were the only allied nation that used women in combat that put women on the front lines, not in support roles, not in just the medical battalions, but actually allowed them to pick up rifles and join the Red Army, climb into combat planes and fire guns. You know, this is the, on the only allied nation that allowed women to do that. And so therefore there are a great many uh, Soviet women war heroines who just were absolutely astounding tales of bravery. And really chief among those, as I was reading, was uh, Lyudmila Pavlichenko, who was a Ukrainian war heroine. And uh, I think anyone reading about the about Ukraine now and the fight there and the incredible toughness of the resistance will be able to see that in Mila as well, because she was, you know, really quite an unassuming person. She was 25 years old. She was a single mother, a, a library researcher, a graduate student with a dissertation she was trying to finish. She All she wanted to do was be a historian and make a life for herself and her young son, uh, but her homeland is invaded. And she has is faced with the option of, if I, I or people like me do not push Hitler back out of Ukraine, my son will grow up in the Hitler youth. And that was not acceptable to her. And she enlisted. She was already an excellent markswoman because she had um, she had already taken some bat taken some courses in her civilian life. And so she got a rifle. She started racking up a tally, and she ended up with a tally in less almost uh, less than eighteen months of fighting. She ended up with a tally of three hundred nine Nazi dead. Do you often find it more challenging to write the early version of a character's life? Or in the aftermath years later, say for instance, as you did with Mila, when she wound up in DC after the war befriending the first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, before her past came full circle in the story's very gripping third act. If that wasn't enough to make her a fascinating subject for a novel, she was then sent in 1942 on a Goodwill tour to the United States where um, she, while she was there, you know, in her mission of trying to, you know, um, encourage the, the United States to send aid and open a second front in Europe against uh, Hitler, she also became very good friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. And I just thought, you know, that that was just so incredible to me, just the idea that, you know, the first lady of the United States and a Ukrainian female sniper becoming White House best friends, you know, it's just, it was too good to ignore. So even from the days of the Huntress, I sort of tucked uh, Lyudmila Pavlichenko in my back pocket and I thought I got to write that story. So after the Rose Cut, I decided it was time. Congratulations on Marie Claire recently crowning Diamond Eye their book pick of the month. It's reflecting just how successfully these stories you're telling for the first time are filtering down into the mainstream for new generations to appreciate. It must be rewarding after investing so much time in researching and writing them to know your books are reaching so many readers around the world. That's you know one of the greatest gifts a writer can ever get. Um, I've had some wonderful emails or letters from people who have said things like, "My mother was a code girl uh, on the on the American side of the code breaking process," or that like, "My father worked in at Bletchley Park and we always knew that, but he never said anything." And this book helped me feel closer to him. These, those are some of the best the best kinds of news you can ever get. And because you know, for fiction, and I do, you know, I write historical fiction, my job is to entertain and to tell a story. But I do hope that, you know, it, I always hope that, you know, people can get something more out of it than a few hours of, you know, entertainment. If it helps you feel a little closer to a family member or who is maybe now gone, or if it helps you just, you know, gives you an interest to, you know, dive down that rabbit hole and find more information by going and looking up the biographies and, you know, the nonfiction that's wonderful, you know, then I, I think that's a wonderful bonus. 
because really people ask all the time, it's like, well, why write a novel? Why not just write by write a nonfiction and um, or something? But, you know, the two aren't exclusive. They feed each other. And I think, you know, the best historical fiction hopefully sends you on a hunt to find the real stories as well as the fictional ones. And that spirit, before we go, we understand you've been at work on a new novel. Please tell us what fans can expect to get their hands on next. I am now working on a book which is at least tentatively titled The Briar Club. And it is uh, a story set in the 1950s in Washington, D.C., you know, with uh, McCarthyism, the Red Scare, the Korean War, and a great deal more going on. Mm. Kate, it has been such a pleasure talking today. Congratulations on all your success, and thank you for taking out time to be on About the Authors TV. All right. Thank you so much. This has really been a delightful thing.